Thank you very much. So hands up anyone who's heard of a Saiga before today. Whoa, I'm so happy. Those of you who haven't, um, I hope to really uh, inspire and enlighten you about this amazing species. So nearly 30 years ago, I was a student. I was desperate to see Saiga antelopes. I went to Kazakhstan, I went and traveled for two weeks. I didn't see a single antelope. I drove across vast areas of steppe. And then, right on the last day, our driver of our jeep stopped the car right in the middle of a sandy track towards evening. And we got out and we had a look. And there, lying in the rut of the road, was a baby saiga. And it was keeping warm against, against the cold night. That was my only saiga on that trip. That was my first saiga. And um, it's still my sky hurricane today. After, after 29 years, it made such an impression. I couldn't leave after that. So today I'm going to tell you a story about saigas, and I call it resurrection, and I hope you'll understand by the end uh, why I've put a question mark, but I'm positive. Before I tell you the story, I have to show you a picture of saigas and show why I fell in love with them, and hopefully you will too. Are they not the most amazing, extraordinary things? <laughs> so the Saigas live in Central Asia, and I'm going to tell you about Uzbekistan, which is one of the places where they live, and in particular about this area of northern Uzbekistan and the Aral Sea region, which is the little bit of blue you can see there in the box. So this is a story about reckless human greed. It's a story about destruction, and about probably the worst human-caused environmental disaster that has happened so far. And we've got a lot of candidates, and they're getting to be more. This is the Aral Sea. So in 1977, it was the fourth largest inland sea in the world, the fourth largest water body in the world. Um, over 40 years, basically, we lost it. You can see from these satellite images that there's just remnants left in 2014. I'm going to also tell you a story about a passionate group of people who really care about the Saigas and are working to make life a better place. I'm also going to tell you a story about a road trip that I took last year with my friends from the Saiga Conservation Alliance and some of you will recognize friends and colleagues from uh, WCN who came out to see our programs. And um, I'm going to intertwine those three stories and it'll all make sense at the end. So here's the range of the Saiga. It's found in Kazakhstan, Russia, Uzbekistan, and Mongolia. There's only five populations in the whole world. Granted, they're big populations, but only five different populations. The one in Uzbekistan is called the Ustjurt population. As you can see, it straddles the boundary between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And the Saigas move between the two countries um, to find fodder and get away from harsh winters. The saiga is the most amazing species. It's extraordinary as well because it's the only ungulate species to be found on these steps. So it's the only grazer on these steps, wild grazer. You can see the males have horns and the females don't. Um, and they move for large distances to try and find food. The reason why they have to move is because it's a harsh continental climate. It's a place where it's really dry and hot in the summer. It can get up to, to 40 degrees centigrade. Sorry, I don't know Fahrenheit. Um, in the summer, it's hot, um, so there's very little, and it gets down to minus 40 in the winter um, with lots of snow, so there's no food. So in this harsh continental climate, they have to move around a lot to find their food. Humans have had a relationship with saigas for millennia. So saigas are a relic of the Pleistocene, Pleistocene the Ice Age. So after the Ice Age, there were woolly mammoths, there were uh, woolly rhinos, there were saber-toothed cats, and there were saigas, and it's the only one that's left. This is a picture showing, and you can see them actually on cave paintings um, from the Neolithic times. This is, a, this is something from about the 9th to the 12th century, so a long, long time ago. It's called an aran, and what it is, is it's, a, it's an arrow-shaped 
um, huge hunting thing where they used to drive herds of saigas into this um, enclosure and then, and then kill them for meat. You can see how huge it is because on that second picture, can you see the tiny car at the bottom? So that shows how enormous that thing is. You can only, you're only just, we're only just actually finding it now that we can do kind of aerial surveys. So that's how many saigas there were as well in those days that they were prepared to build these enormous, and there are hundreds of them across the steppe, not used anymore. People also have other relationships to saigas. So that stuffed head is an amulet that was found in Uzbekistan in someone's house. It kind of brings people luck. And then also, sadly, and this is the downfall, uh, the saigas have a relationship with humans as part of traditional Chinese medicine. So they're used in China uh, for all sorts of things like fever. Um, and I took that picture in Kowloon in Hong Kong uh, only a year or so ago. Saigas were also noted in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, the Russian Empire came down to the, to the Central Asian areas and they killed loads of saigas. And they killed them and they transported them to China for Chinese medicine. So that when the first Russian explorers came in the 19th century, they said, they wrote in their books that there were thousands of saigas covering the steppe as far as they could see. But by the end of the 19th century, they were writing about horns being taken across the border. They were writing about saigas almost being extinct. And actually, it was the Soviet Union that saved them because the Soviet Union put the borders up. Uh, they couldn't traffic them anymore. And suddenly, it was possible for the saigas to recover. And by the kind of 1980s, they had. They were a really resilient species. And you could see, again, herds of thousands of animals covering the steppe just like this, and a beautiful sight. Then, the fall of the Soviet Union came. That was a tragedy um, for the Saigas because the money went for all the management and all the conservation that had been going all the time, and there was no one there to save them, there was no one there to protect them. At the same time, the withdrawal of subsidies from farming meant that um, there was no money anymore, people had to uh, find some way to make a living. Uh, you can see that ruined village there. And there was a ready market in China for the first time in 70 years. So what they did was they hunted saigas, they hunted them for meat, but they also hunted them for horns across the border into China. And you can guess what happened then. What happened was a massive decline. Not just a massive decline, but the largest, the fastest decline ever recorded for a mammal species. In 10 years, 95% of the saiga antelopes were gone. So that was quite something. That was the uh, early 1990s to the mid-1990s. And I actually saw that decline um, through my own eyes as I, as I was working. So that's the story of the saiga. I told you there were three stories we were going to all fit together. The second story is the story of Uzbekistan and the Aral Sea that I told you at the beginning. So Uzbekistan now, you might think of it as a kind of neglected backwater of the former Soviet Union, a place that very few people have heard of or visited. How, how many people have visited Uzbekistan? There we go, a handful. Yeah, you don't count because you live there. <laughs> so Uzbekistan actually is a center of culture and learning. It is the cradle of astronomy. So in the kind of a thousand years ago, it's where astronomy was born. It's got a wonderful, rich, culture. Part of that culture forever has been the Aral Sea. So this, as I said, was this enormous inland body of water with a huge delta where people were growing crops, where people were um, fishing, and the water came from two enormous rivers. In ancient times, one of them was called the Oxus. It was uh, known about in Greek, uh, in Greek writings. It came down from the Himalayas and the Pamir Mountains, and it made this beautiful delta and this wonderful sea, where there was fishing, where there was all sorts of things going on. By the time of the Soviet times, it was an enormous port. It was a military port where people were coming and being sent off all over the place. It also had a huge fishing industry. It supplied fish to the whole of the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, and caviar. So um, that was great. That was a huge economy. The other thing that the Aracy area was famous for was cotton. So they grew large amounts of cotton. Unfortunately, 
Cotton requires huge amounts of pesticide and huge amounts of water. And so they diverted these rich, flowing rivers into these cotton fields, and virtually no water went to the Aral Sea anymore. And that is why I talk about human destruction and recklessness, because they dried up this enormous sea by diverting it into the cotton fields. Worse than that, well, as bad as that, um, the pesticides, when the seed dr dried up, and you can see here the old escarpment of the sea and the sea retreated, um, all the pesticides got into the dust and they were blown for miles and miles and miles. People got cancers, uh, people lost their livelihoods. Um, it was a terrible, terrible ecological tragedy. During the time of the Soviet Union, there was an island in the middle of the Aral Sea, and that was called Resurrection Island. That island was used as a secret chemical weapons testing laboratory for biological weapons, so they tested anthrax and plague and all sorts of other horrible things that you could use. It was a, it was a closed island that people couldn't go to. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, the uh, island was shut, the chemical weapons thing went away, and you have these kind of ghost towns of what used to be this facility. People didn't go there, though, because they were scared of the, we of the chemical weapons. You would be. Um, and also, it was hard to get to. But over time, as the Aral Sea dried up and retreated, it became possible to go there. It became a peninsula. And so people were able to start to access it again. However, it had been 40 years or so where it had not had humans on it. And so it had this rich wildlife, beautiful raptors, wonderful animals, really typical steppe environments. And um, it had been sort of become a, a bit of a sanctuary. So how do my stories connect the Saigas and Vosrozhenia Island, sorry, Resurrection Island? Um, it connects through the Saigas, and the fact that the island not only protected wolves and steppe eagles and all the rest of it, it also protected Saigas. So here are some Saiga footprints, and they're, they're walking on the soft bed of the Aral Sea around this island. So, skipping again, the Saiga Conservation Alliance has been working in Uzbekistan for 13 years. And we've done all sorts of things. We've done a lot of work with kids, teaching them about saigas so that they talk to their parents and tell them about poaching not being a good thing, tell them about the fact that it's a wonderful endemic species that's only found in these areas, um, and working to, to um, improve their understanding of their unique wildlife. At school, they're taught about all sorts of exotic things like penguins and lions and things like that, and they're not taught about their own wonderful, precious wildlife. So we help to do that. We also worked to have alternative sources of income for people so that their families didn't have to poach anymore. And if you go out and see our stall, you'll see the wonderful embroidered um, pencil cases and jewelry cases that these women make. And they make them because um, they can bring income into their households and they can talk to their husbands and their sons and their uncles and their brothers and tell them, don't poach tigers. And they also have enough money um, to buy meat so that they don't need to poach. We also work with national parks authorities. We work to, to protect rangers. We work to, to protect saigas. We work to monitor for saigas. So that's all the stuff we've been doing. But things haven't been going so well for the saiga in Uzbekistan. In fact, there are hardly any left. And some of that is to do with the fact that um, in 2012, the Kazakh authorities built this enormous border fence. And that border fence cut off the migration pathways for the saigas that move backwards and forwards between their pastures in two countries. Saigas don't respect boundaries. Saigas don't know about countries, but they can't get through these fences. So that, as well as the poaching, has hit the saiga really hard. Here's some poaching. And you can see here the horns have been cut off um, because they're selling them to China. They haven't bothered to keep everything else. So a few years ago, Side Conservation Alliance mounted an expedition to, Vos to, to Resurrection Island, to this island where the, uh, where the secret establishment was. And we were amazed. We were amazed to see saigas still, given how precarious things were, and we were amazed to see all that wildlife I showed you. And we thought, 
This is the chance for hope. This is the, this is the way that we can think about the future. So now, I'm telling you the story of the road trip. And these bad photos are because I'm a bad photographer, and they're taken from a minibus. So first we saw the beautiful culture. I told you about the wonderful culture of, of Uzbekistan. Then we saw the destruction. So here's the end of the uh, river. It's about 50 kilometers from, from where the sea used to be, and it just dries out in a sandbank. That's it just stops. And we saw that amazing huge port that was so buzzing that was enormous supplying fish to all, all around um, Russia and the Soviet Union as a kind of tumble down village. But we also saw people who loved Saigas, they loved the environment and they wanted to do something. This is a village called Kalkalpakstan and it's a, a noted hotspot for poachers but it's a place where the teachers were desperate to learn about environment and to help us and the children were so enthusiastic. We found young people who were really, really keen. Oh dear, I haven't got very many dresses, you can see. Uh, <laughs> children who were really, really keen to, to help us. Um, we also found gas companies, so coming into the area, and they're really keen to work with us as well, which is an interesting thing. And this is uh, Munak town, the, the town with all the fish people, and we saw this famous site, this is probably the only thing people know about the Aral Sea. These are the sh ships that were left behind when the sea dried up. Um, it's a kind of ship graveyard. And um, believe it or not, that's potentially a basis for tourism because people are interested to come and see uh, these amazing sites. It's an extraordinary monument. So we thought, okay, so we can work with these people. We can do something that's really going to save things. Because the other thing we saw, interestingly, was that seabed that desperate, polluted, horrible bit of land that was just a salt flat is starting to come back, it's starting to regenerate. People are putting little lakes in, and that's to stabilize the sands. They've dropped seeds of these plants here to try to make sure that the sand isn't blowing everywhere. And actually, animals are coming back. And this is a place where Saigas could live. This is the kind of place that Saigas actually like to be. So we can start to see Saigas moving back into the area. The Saigas are also protected because you saw those footprints in the mud. Saigas can walk on the mud. Poachers can't drive on the mud. They get stuck. And so we've, with the island, with its beautiful intact fauna and flora as their base, they're safe to go out and um, get away from poachers. So can we not make a protected area there? Can we not make it a place where saigas and other wildlife are safe and is part of this regeneration? So yes, this is not the beautiful, bountiful sea that was here 100 years ago. It's not a perfect natural habitat, but it is a habitat, yeah? It's something that can see us for the future. These are the children in Munak School. They were so keen to talk to us. They were so keen to work with us on Saigas. And they've got, they're so full of ambition and intelligence and drive that we can harness with their teachers. They drew these most beautiful and touching uh, pictures. They have never seen a Saiga, and yet they drew these lovely pictures of them. Um, they're really full of, of heart and love for them. And what touched me more than anything, given the history, is that they always drew them with water. Water is so precious for them. Um, so they see this nature is really important. So can we make Munak a center for environmental education, a place where everyone from the, from the community, including the chiefs right the way down to the, the school children, want to work together to build a better future for themselves and their environment out of this tragedy, where the kids actually know about poaching and the fact that poaching is wrong, where the women can do their handicrafts and can sell them to the tourists who are going to come and see what is actually an extraordinary place. And where the Saiga can be the thing that brings everyone together as the kind of flagship for this project. So we have a vision. Our vision is a five-year vision. It's a five-year plan to get this done. It's a new, exciting, innovative project of the kind that has not been done before, but that builds on all the things we've done over the many years. So in the first year, we're going to do research with all the different villagers to try to understand what they want and to talk to government. We'll talk to the villagers and try and find out what's happening. In the second year, we'll be working with those schools to, um, to build their ecological awareness. We'll start the crafts program 
and we'll start to plan for protected areas. In the third year, we'll be ready for tourists because we'll have some things to show them. They can talk to the kids, they can, they can buy the embroidery. In the fourth year, we'll have got a protected area planning, we'll have worked with the government to get a protected area that's actually going to work. So we'll be training the protected area staff and we'll be equipping them with the need, what they need. In the fifth year, importantly, we'll be able to step back because it will be self-sustaining. We'll have the tourism, we'll have the protected area planning. So I think we'll be able to move on to understand how this has worked. And in the meantime, we'll have all sorts of little things that people can do to help. They can buy materials for the kids. They can buy equipment for the rangers. I told you one story. But I could have told you a hundred other stories. I could have told you the story of these uh, rangers in, um, in Russia who protect Saiga through the coldest, coldest winters and the driest places. Um, and they do that. Before we came in, they did it in a minibus. They had to sleep in their van in minus 40 degrees in order to be able to protect the Saigas. We built them a little field station in the center of their protected area so that they could guard the Saigas all year round and all time round and be safe sleeping under cover. And you can see how the Saigas like it. Grazing right near there. I could also tell you of the brave rangers in Kazakhstan who um, worked so hard to protect Saigas. And in particular, the tragedy of the fact that we lost two rangers who were killed by poachers in Kazakhstan this year. This is Yerlan Nogaliev, who was killed by poachers this year um, while he was out in the field looking for saigas. These dots are dead saigas. You can see them stretching into the distance. I could have told you a story about the 200,000 saigas that dropped dead in two weeks um, four years ago from a mystery bacterial disease and how we worked together with, with saigas, with saiga experts from Kazakhstan and around the world, vets and, and biologists, to understand that disease and put things in place to make sure that it never um, had such a massive impact again. Or I could have told you a story about religion and how religion and conservation go together. So in Russia, uh, Kalmykia is the only Buddhist area in Europe and it's a place where they worship um, this guy called the White Old Man, who is their local saint, um, local Buddhist deity. And his symbol, can you see his symbol? It's a saiga. So, just to finish off, I hope you now see why I called this story Resurrection with a question mark. It's a story of tragedy. It's a story of human recklessness and despair. But it's also a story of hope. And it's a story where I believe we can build a future for Saigas and people that is new and different, but still is a wonderful future. And I hope that you might come on the journey with us. And I hope that if you do that, you'll love Saigas as much as I did when I saw that first one 30 years ago. Thank you. <laughs>